bring you over to our PowerPoint presentation. And I want you to take a picture, or not a picture, excuse me. I want you to take a look <clears throat> at this picture here. And when you first look at it, it's pretty daunting. Um, this is the overview of the parasympathetic pathways. Uh, uh, we already talked about that. And then we talked about our sympathetic pathways. So today we are going to go through and discuss the various sympathetic pathways. So by the time I'm done today with class, you will understand this diagram much better. Okay, I'm not going to say you're going to understand it great. I hope you do, okay, because it can be somewhat daunting. But we're going to go through these different pathways, how our preganglionic uh, axons synapse at the ganglion onto the postganglionic uh, neuron, and then the postganglionic neurons will go out to the effectors <clears throat> in various organs. And we're going to kind of see. So all these pathways, I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. And when you first look at it, and we talked about earlier all right, our cervical ganglions and what their role was, what uh, viscera, uh, what effectors that they affected. Now we're going to move down here into our, our sympathetic pathway. You recall when we're talking about the sympathetic pathway, another uh, 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 division of the autonomic nervous system, we also refer to it as the thoracolumbar division. And again, that's because a lot of those preganglionic neurons emerge from right, our spinal cord right, in the areas of the thoracic region of the spinal cord to the uh, superior uh, region of the lumbar portion of the spinal cord, L1 and L2. So you can see all these little brown all right, lines here coming from the spinal cord going out to our sympathetic chain. Remember, this is called the sympathetic chain. And these bulges here represent the sympathetic chain ganglia. So we're going to see how the preganglionic neurons are going to enter into the sympathetic chain. And then there's going to be, again, a couple different options, depending on which pathway we're talking about, that the postganglionic um, axons will, will uh, encounter and then out to the, the various effectors. So again, I'm hoping by the end of this class, you will understand these pathways uh, it, it, much better than you do right now, okay? So let's start off, we already saw the sympathetic trunk here. Let's start off with a little bit of an explanation of the different parts to our sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. So if you recall, okay, our sympathetic division, the preganglionic axons are short. So that means that the autonomic ganglia have to be close to the spinal cord because those preganglionic axons are so short, we need to have those ganglia close. So we talked about that sympathetic tr trunk that resides just outside. If you look, whoops, if you look here at our little picture here, you can see here's the vertebra or vertebral spine here. And you can see just on either side, you have the sympathetic trunk and the various sympathetic uh, trunk ganglia in close proximity. And then we're gonna follow right, all the different pathways for these post-ganglionic axons here. Well, in order to get into our sympathetic trunk, we have an on-ramp, and then also to get out of the sympathetic trunk, we have an off-ramp. So if you recall, in lab, we talked about the white and gray rami communicantes. And that's basically what is going to connect our spinal nerve to the sympathetic trunk. So think of the white rami communicantes as the entrance ramp. So our preganglionic myelinated sympathetic axons are going to enter into the sympathetic trunk through the white rami communicantes. Then while they're in there, right, this is not always gonna be the case, but for our example right now, while they're in there, they're gonna synapse onto the postganglionic axon. And then those postganglionic axons are going to exit the sympathetic trunk. So think of the gray rami communicantes as the exit ramp. And so the postganglionic sympathetic 
axons, which are unmyelinated, are going to vacate or leave the sympathetic trunk through the gray rami communicantes, the exit ramp. All right, so we're going to go over all the different various options as to what happens here. But for the most part, that's what we're going to see. So a couple other structures that we should talk about before we go over the pathways are the sympathetic splanchnic nerves. Our sympathetic splanchnic nerves are preganglionic axons, but here's the important part. They do not, they do not synapse in the sympathetic trunk. So what will happen is these preganglionic pre-ganglionic uh, pre axons, what we call, all right, our splanchnic nerves, will enter into the sympathetic trunk, right, and they, but they will not exit out through our gray rami communicantes. Instead, they're going to come out anteriorly through the front, and they're going to travel all the way out to a ganglia, and we call the ganglia that they're going to interact with our prevertebral ganglia. And these prevertebral ganglia are located anteriorly all right, to our spine, whereas our sympathetic trunk, remember that was lateral, that was on either side of the spine, where our prevertebral ganglia are in front of the spine. And you know what else is in front of the spine? You got it, the aorta. And so these prevertebral these pre ganglia will be located at various locations along your abdominal aorta. So we will find them in the abdominal pelvic cavity there. So there's three of them, right? We have the celiac, the superior mesenteric, and the inferior mesenteric ganglia. Now this is nice because you'll learn this in bio 211. And if you're unlucky enough to have me, I'm just kidding, if I'm very fortunate enough to have you, we will learn these different branches of the aorta but we name these ganglia after these branches off of your abdominal aorta. So you have the celiac, the superior mesenteric, and the inferior mesenteric. So let's start off with each ganglia, and I'll tell you where they're located. The celiac ganglia all right, is located on the very first branch of the descending abdominal aorta. So as soon as your descending aorta punches through your diaphragm, just inferior to the diaphragm, it gives off this short branch, this short uh, uh, blood vessel called the celiac artery. And so in close proximity to the celiac artery is the celiac ganglia. Well, it's this ganglia that our greater thoracic splanchnic nerve is going to enter into. And it, the greater thoracic splanchnic nerve is going to be made up of our preganglionic axons. So those preganglionic axons will synapse on the postganglionic axons in the celiac ganglia, and those postganglionic axons are going to go out and innervate various abdominal pelvic uh, organs. Okay, the stomach, the duodenum. You recall that's the first part of your small intestine. Right? Our spleen and liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. So those are the various viscera and organs that the postganglionic axons are going to innervate that come out of the uh, um, celiac ganglia. Okay, so the next gan prevertebral ganglia is the superior mesenteric ganglia. Well, as I would say, luck would have it, but luck has nothing to do with this, but as anatomy would have it, the next branch off of your descending abdominal aorta is the superior mesenteric ganglia. Uh, excuse me, is the superior mesenteric artery. And so in close proximity to that artery, we will have our superior mesenteric ganglia. So in this scenario, the preganglionic axons right, that come into this ganglia come from the lesser and least thoracic splanchnic nerves. Okay, keep in mind the lesser and least thoracic splanchnic nerves. And then they'll uh, synapse onto the postganglionic axons, and those postganglionic axons will go out to the small intestine, the large intestine, the pancreas, kidney, and the ureters. So let me go back to that one picture here. So that's kind of like what we're seeing here. You know me, I love pictures. So you can see here, right, we have various preganglionic axons 
coming from the spinal cord, not synapsing in our sympathetic trunk, going right out from the sympathetic trunk, and then going to our celiac ganglia. And then they will synapse onto our postganglionic neurons, right? That travel out to those various abdominal pelvic viscera. Then you can see down here, right? We have various preganglionic axons, again, not synapsing in the sympathetic trunk. They travel through the sympathetic trunk, exit anteriorly, and then they'll go in this scenario to the superior mesenteric ganglion. And that's going to be the lesser thoracic splanchnic nerve and our least thoracic splanchnic nerve. They'll both travel to the superior mesenteric ganglia, synapse onto our postganglionic axons and our neurons. And then those postganglionic neurons will then again travel out to various our abdominal pelvic organs. All right. And then finally, we're going to talk about our last ganglion, which is our inferior mesenteric ganglion. Right. The inferior mesenteric ganglion happens to be located around the inferior mesenteric artery, which is the third branch that comes off of the descending abdominal aorta. And so the preganglionic neurons, we call those the lumbar splanchnic nerves, they're going to enter into the inferior mesenteric ganglia, synapse onto the postganglionic axons, which will then exit and innervate the large usually the distal portion of the large intestine, the rectum, which is pretty much at the terminal end of your digestive tract, and then some of the structures down in your pelvis, the bladder, ureters, and some of the reproductive organs located down in the pelvic cavity there. So let me just jump back to that picture real fast, showing you the last portion. Here you can see, all right, our lumbar splanchnic nerves, which are the preganglionic axons, all right, that come into the inferior mesenteric ganglion, synapse on the postganglionic neurons, and then those postganglionic neurons will um, exit and go out to the various distal portions of your small and large intestine, and then down here into the bladder, right, and some of our various reproductive organs, again, located in the pelvic cavity. All right, so now that we know some of the players involved in some of these pathways, let's look at the actual pathways. So like I said, this picture, all right, that we started off this class with right here, we're just now gonna put what this diagram is showing you, all right, visually in picture form. Now we're just gonna put it to words. And so we're gonna walk through the four various sympathetic pathways, all right, that you just saw in that picture. All right. So we're pretty much going to start off with and talk about the sympathetic trunk and then what happens, right, after the sympathetic trunk. There's four pathways that we're going to talk about. So the first one is the spinal nerve pathway. The spinal nerve pathway, this is important that you know this, right, is going to be for the skin effectors. Remember, our effectors are going to be muscle and glands involuntary muscle, which is cardiac muscle and smooth muscle, we're going to primarily focus on smooth muscle and the glands like the sweat glands that are going to be found in your neck, torso, and your limbs. So we know the story, the preganglionic neuron, which is going to originate in the spinal cord, will exit out of the spinal cord and go into the sympathetic trunk. How does it get into the sympathetic trunk? It enters in through the white rami communicantes. That is the myelinated preganglionic entrance ramp into the sympathetic trunk. When it gets into the sympathetic trunk, it will synapse with a postganglionic neuron. Our postganglionic neuron is unmyelinated, and that postganglionic neuron will exit out of our sympathetic trunk through the gray rami communicantes, right? And, and it will travel to the effector. A very important point though, when we get, okay, a synapse and now our postganglionic axon is going to exit out of the sympathetic trunk, wherever it synapses, it has to exit. All right, 
the spinal, it has to exit the sympathetic trunk at that same spinal level, okay? At the same spinal level. Because I'm gonna show you, there's three options here when we're talking about the spinal nerve and you'll understand what I'm talking about when we talk about the spinal nerve pathway. So keep in mind, all right, our postganglionic axon, all right, once it uh, is the, the, the synapse has occurred between the preganglionic axon and the postganglionic axon, right, that postganglionic axon is going to exit out of the sympathetic trunk at the same level as to where the synapse occurred. So if the synapse occurs, right, at the T6 level of our spinal nerve and the sympathetic trunk, then that postganglionic axon is going to exit out at T6. So let me show you. Picture is always the best. All right, so let's zoom in here. Here is our preganglionic axon. It exits out of the spinal cord. The cell body is located in the lateral gray horn here of our uh, spinal cord here. It exits out through the anterior roots into the spinal nerve, enters into the sympathetic trunk through the white rami communicantes. Here you can see it synapses onto a postganglionic axon, then that postganglionic axon exits out of the sympathetic trunk through, through the gray rami communicantes. And then it goes out to one of the effectors on that same level. Could be smooth muscle in a blood vessel, could be smooth muscle here in the skin of the erecti pili uh, muscle to help with goosebump reaction, also sweat glands, okay? So again, wherever that synapse occurs is where, right, that postganglionic axon has to exit out. So here you can see this all happening on the same level. This next part here shows you, because this, there's, remember I told you there's three options. Right. The next option is same story, preganglionic axon is going to enter into the sympathetic trunk. But now you can see it ascends upwards. It can ascend one level, two levels, three levels, doesn't matter. Okay? But it ascends superiorly. And it arrives to a specific spinal segment, T4, T5, whatever. Okay? It, it arrives to a specific spinal cord segment, and then it synapses onto a postganglionic axon. Once it's synapsed, it's got to leave. Sorry, buddy, you synapsed, it's time to go. So if it came in at T8 and it ascends up to T7 or T6 and synapses onto a postganglionic axon, then it's gotta, it has to leave at that level. And so that's what we see here. And then our final option, same scenario, the preganglionic neuron, all right, exits out of the spinal cord, enters into the sympathetic trunk. In this case, it descends. It moves inferiorly. Down one, two, three, four levels, doesn't matter. Okay? But it descends down, and then it synapses onto a postganglionic neuron. Once that happens, think of it like something that just is automatically going to kick you out of the system. You do this and we're kicking you out. Hey, you dance on that table again at the club, I'm kicking you out, all right? So in this situation, okay, once this neuron, the preganglionic neuron synapses in the postganglionic neuron, we're kicking that postganglionic neuron out at that level. Boom, it leaves, same scenario, okay? So those are the three options that occur at our spinal nerve pathway. All right, again, you need to know the structures. It's going to be the structures found in your skin, okay, in the neck, in the torso, and in your limbs. All right, that's the first pathway, the spinal nerve pathway. Our next pathway is what we call the postganglionic sympathetic nerve pathway. All right, so let's talk about what effectors are where. In this scenario, the effectors are going to be found for the internal organs in your chest and the thorax and in your neck, okay? Heart and lungs, heart and esophagus. We'll also see some of the skin effectors for the head and neck. And now we're gonna move into your eyes, okay? 
the effectors of the eyelid and the dilator pupillae muscles, all right, located in your eye, in your iris. All right, so how does this pathway work? The preganglionic neurons, same scenario, exit out of the spinal cord. And in this case, they're going to enter into that sympathetic trunk ganglion and synapse, all right? So they're going to synapse there. The postganglionic axon, all right, in this case, in this case, is going to leave the sympathetic trunk, all right, not via the gray rami communicantes. It is going to directly come out from the front here, from that ganglion all the way to the effector. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Here you can see right, the preganglionic axon, right? Exits the spinal cord, same story, enters into the sympathetic trunk, okay, through the white rami communicantes, synapses onto our postganglionic neuron, but that postganglionic neuron does not exit out through the gray ramus. It comes directly out of the anterior portion of the sympathetic trunk and it goes out to any of the various viscera or effectors located in the head and neck, in the eye, right, in the various viscera of your thoracic cavity there. Similar situation, all right, because it, when it enters into the sympathetic trunk, it can, all right, synapse at that same level. But again, you know the rule, we got to kick you out. Once you synapse, we're kicking you out. So it can enter in, it can ascend up, it can descend down. But in this scenario, right, the postganglionic neuron, okay, the postganglionic neuron does not exit out through the gray ramus. It goes directly from the, through the anterior portion of the trunk and goes directly to the effector. All right, our next sympathetic pathway is the splanchnic nerve pathway. Right. And if you recall, we talked about the splanchnic nerve pathway. So let's put it into some words here because maybe you didn't have um, a very good explanation by me uh, with the pictures. So let's look at the splanchnic nerve. All right, where are the effectors located? Now we're going to move a little bit more inferior. So we're going to be looking at the abdominal pelvic viscera here. So the effectors are going to be located below the diaphragm. So in this scenario, we're dealing with the splanchnic nerve. Remember those preganglionic axons, those are the ones that come from the spinal cord. They're gonna enter into the sympathetic trunk, but guess what? No synapsing whatsoever. And so they're gonna exit out of the sympathetic trunk anteriorly, and they're gonna travel, all right, to our prevertebral ganglia. You remember those prevertebral ganglia, I hope. Okay, the celiac ganglia, the superior mesenteric ganglia, and the inferior mesenteric ganglia, right? all of those okay, ganglia are going to be located near the descending abdominal aorta. So these splanchnic nerves, which are preganglionic axons, do not synapse in the sympathetic trunk. They go right to the prevertebral ganglia, synapse there on the postganglionic axons, and then those postganglionic axons go out to the effectors. So here's that picture there. Okay, same story, okay? Preganglionic neurons exit out of the spinal cord. They enter into the sympathetic trunk through, always through our entrance ramp, our white ramus. So they enter through the white ramus. They do not, they do not synapse with anything, All right? They can either enter in and leave at the same level. They can descend they can ascend, all right? So there's always options. But wherever, right, they will eventually leave the sympathetic trunk, not through the gray ramus, right? They will leave without synapsing anteriorly to one of our prevertebral ganglia, depending on which organs that we're talking about. They'll synapse onto the postganglionic neurons, and then those postganglionic neurons will travel out to the various viscera located in the abdominal pelvic cavity there. That is the splanchnic nerve pathway. So far, so good, not too bad. 
One last pathway, and in my opinion, it's the easiest pathway. It is the most simple pathway because it only involves one neuron. There's no two neuron chain here. We're dealing with one neuron. All right, so this is the adrenal medulla pathway. And in case you're wondering, the adrenal medulla is the center portion of your adrenal gland. And a lot of folks, if you ask them, they don't even need to really take a science course, but there's a good number of folks that know that the adrenal gland, all right, produces adrenaline. Well, we don't call it adrenaline, right? Here, right, the adrenal medulla, which is part of the adrenal gland, is going to produce epinephrine and norepinephrine. That's what we always like to refer to as adrenaline, okay? But it's these hormones that will help us right, when we are dealing with the fight or flight response, okay, when we really need to get all systems online quickly, give you that superhuman strength that you heard about, some mother lifting a car off of her infant, right, this is the pathway that's going to initiate that. So the adrenal medulla pathway, our preganglionic axon is going to exit from the spinal cord, it's going to enter into the sympathetic trunk, it will not synapse, it's gonna enter into the prevertebral ganglia. It will not synapse there either. And it's gonna go directly to the adrenal medulla and it's going to stimulate the neurosecretory cells there to release epinephrine and norepinephrine into your blood. And this is what's going to help give you that fight or flight response, that boost of energy, that boost of strength, right? And this pathway is only going to be one single neuron. Because remember, what happens at synapses? Things slow down. When we're dealing with our chemical synapses, when we're converting our electrical action potential nerve signal into a chemical messenger nerve signal through the use of neurotransmitters, that slows us down. Well, guess what? We're not gonna slow you down with this pathway. So here you have your preganglionic neuron exiting out of the spinal cord, entering into the sympathetic chain, not synapsing, traveling down into the prevertebral ganglion, again, not synapsing, and going directly to the adrenal medulla, where it stimulates those cells to release norepinephrine and epinephrine into your blood. That's it. That preganglionic neuron travels through the splanchnic nerves because that's a free pathway right here to the prevertebral ganglion. Told you that's the easiest one, the easiest pathway out of all four. All right. So, enough with the sympathetic pathways. Let's talk about a couple of important concepts here. Now, in a few moments, we're going to discuss <clears throat> our um, some uh, uh, concept when we talk about autonomic or visceral reflexes. It's really going to be important that you understand that information when you get into Bio 211. And so I'll give you a brief introduction to that. So hopefully when you're taking Bio 211 and you're thinking, wow, you know, this stuff all looks familiar, you're going to be saying, thank you, Dr. Kaz, you were right, I should listen to you, I hope. Okay, so autonomic tone, what is autonomic tone? Okay, here's a scenario in which, all right, our effectors in our body, for the most part, all right, when we're talking about the effectors, right, when we're dealing with cardiac muscle tissue, smooth muscle tissue, and glands, right, most of these effectors are going to be innervated by both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic divisions of the autonomic nervous system. And what we're gonna see is both of these divisions are gonna be releasing their neurotransmitter onto, all right, onto their effector. And so what will happen is if you want one response or the other, what we'll see is inhibition of one of those divisions and activation of the other, okay? But when we have both being released, both neurotransmitters from both divisions, right? We create what's called this autonomic tone. We're gonna to talk a little bit about some of the, the uh, antagonistic and cooperative effects 
right, of the divisions here in a moment. But when we see that continual release by both divisions, we refer to that as autonomic tone. Now, we'll see in some scenarios in which these effectors are only going to be controlled by one division, by one division. So for example, when we're talking about blood vessels, right, the sympathetic division is going to be the only division that is going to affect your blood vessel diameter. So I look at, I, I, I use this example. If you have a gas stove, you turn it on to medium and it generates a flame. So if you wanna turn that flame to a higher, uh, more powerful flame, you turn it up, give it more gas. If you wanna turn it down, maybe uh, let something simmer, you turn it down to make this, the flame really small. Similar type of scenario here when we're dealing with blood vessel diameter. So here's what happens. The sympathetic division is constantly releasing neurotransmitter onto the blood vessel smooth muscles, and it puts it in a partially constricted state. Right? In this partially constricted state, we call vasomotor tone. So like our gas stove, if I want to constrict those blood vessels more, what do I do? I dial it up. I turn on that sympathetic division even more, like our gas. And so that causes an increase in vasoconstriction. If I want to get those blood vessels to dilate then, okay, and I want to make them the, the diameter bigger, then I am going to turn my sympathetic dial down to a low simmer. And so that will decrease that sympathetic activity. When we decrease that sympathetic, when we decrease that sympathetic activity, we cause vasodilation. Okay, so think of it like that. Okay, we have this flame burning. You want to burn it hotter, turn up the gas. Same thing. If we have a blood vessel that's partially constricted, we want to constrict it more, turn up the sympathetic nervous system. Right? If we want to turn it down, we want to get it to simmer. Okay, we turn down the flame. Same thing here. If we want to get more vasodilation to occur, we turn down our sympathetic activity. Right? Similar here, when we talk about vagal tone, that has to do with the vagus nerve, and you all should read should uh, re recall, right, the vagus nerve is one of the four cranial nerves that are part of our parasympathetic division. The vagus nerve is going to influence your heart rate, okay? So that vagus nerve, right, is going to consistently decrease the heart rate because if it wasn't for autonomic innervation of your heart, your heartbeat would be a lot faster and what it is now. You get to learn about that wonderful fact um, later on in uh, bio 211, and I'll leave it to that. But so keep in mind, we want to decrease our heart rate. We up the parasympathetic division through the vagus nerve, and that helps us to decrease the heart rate. That brings me to the dual innervation concept. Okay, keep in mind, when we're dealing with certain viscera, all right, or effectors, both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic divisions of our autonomic nervous system are going to provide that input information, right, that are going to create two possible outcomes. Either we can have an antagonistic effect, if you're not quite sure what that means, it's opposite, or both divisions can work towards a common effect. So let's talk, talk about antagonistic effects. All right. So our two divisions are normally going to oppose each other in regards to antagonistic effects. For example, heart rate, perfect example. If we want to slow the heart down, we just stimulate the parasympathetic uh, uh, division. We increase its activity, and that will help to slow the heart rate. If we want to speed up the heart rate, we turn down the parasympathetic activity and we increase our sympathetic activity and that increase in sympathetic activity will increase the heart rate. Right. And it depends because here's the thing, it's nice because the cells, our cardiac muscle cells, right, will have right, these two different types of receptors. 
So depending on what neurotransmitters being released will determine which receptor is activated and then what effect occurs, whether it's going to be an increase in heart rate or a decrease in heart rate. A couple other ways that we see antagonistic effects occurring, right, when we're talking about the autonomic nervous system, our uh, digestive system, the GI tract, when we're talking about the effects of the smooth muscle. Remember, smooth muscle, right, muscle moves things. In our GI tract, the smooth muscle helps to move digesting food products through all right, your GI tract. Remember, the parasympathetic division is the rest and digest. So in this scenario, the parasympathetic division is going to increase the GI tract motility. It'll get things more mobile. Right? Whereas our sympathetic division is going to decrease the motility. Because normally, I think of it like this. The sympathetic is the fight or flight. So you're running away from a bear, right? Do we really need to waste resources by making sure that food product is moving through your digestive tract as you're running for your life? No. We shut that down, right? And we try to conserve resources for the important exercise, energy, emergency type of scenarios here that we'll need in that type of scenario. So again, same type of scenario that we saw when we were looking at our, our heart rate, okay? We have two different types of receptors on the smooth muscle cells. And so depending on which division is gonna be releasing its neurotransmitter will determine which effector will uh, then be uh, activated for the desired effect. All right, and the last example, the, the, the actual uh, diameter of the pupil, okay? Whether it's big or small, okay? When we're looking at the diameter of the pupil, we're gonna deal with two different muscles in the iris of your eye. I don't, re I don't know if you recall, all right, what we saw uh, in the last class, but I told you how the parasympathetic division is going to cause pupillary constriction and the sympathetic division is going to cause pupillary dilation. And I just gave you that example where the uh, cartoon character is frightened and their eyes pop out of their head and their eyes get really big. Okay, so similar type of scenario here, right, when we're talking about the diameter of the eye, when we are stimulating the parasympathetic division, we're going to see a decrease in the pupil diameter because we are going to stimulate the um, dilate, not, not dilator, the constrictor muscles in the iris. So the sympathetic division is going to cause dilation of the pupil. So the pupil will increase because we're innervating the dilator pupillary muscles, right? That are on the radial periphery of the iris and they will make the eye bigger. We'll see it in much better um, understanding uh, in chapter 16 when we're talking about the eye. So if you don't quite get it now, don't worry. Uh, when we talk about the, uh, the pupil and the iris in chapter 16, I'll go over this in a little bit better detail for you. So do not worry. Stay tuned uh, for that information. But for right now, I want you to understand that the sympathetic division is going to dilate the pupil and the parasympathetic division is going to constrict the pupil. All right. Remember what I told you, when we're dealing with dual innervation, we can either see antagonistic effects or cooperative effects. The cooperative effects are going to be, we're going to see two different responses or effects from each division that is going to be part of the overall response. And the most common uh, used example is um, male sex function, right? I learned in medical school where, when we talked about the dual innervation for the parasympathetic and the sympathetic, um, one of the things that we learned, was, we called it point and shoot, all right? Point and shoot. Point had to do, all right, with uh, penile erection due to the parasympathetic activity. So that's the point por portion of it. And then shoot had to do with the sympathetic activity in the ejaculatory response. So 
to uh, attain the erection, we are going to stimulate the parasympathetic division. And then to actually have an ejaculation of the semen, then we will stimulate the parasymp excuse me, the sympathetic division to cause the ejaculation there. So that is one of the examples of cooperative effects. So just to kind of backpedal and circle back around to what I was talking about with the blood vessels when we talk about how, right, certain systems are only controlled by one division, right? Just to review, the sympathetic division is going to control, right, the, the diameter of your blood vessels. So we can get that dual innervation, all right, with only one division. So when we're talking about the sympathetic division, okay, keep in mind, we turn the dial up on the sympathetic activity, we turn that gas up, we are going to get vasoconstriction. And that's because we've increased that sympathetic activity. And then when we want to get vasodilation, we want to relax uh, those muscles, then we turn the gas down, and we get that decreased sympathetic activity and that causes vasodilation. All right, a couple other things that we need to understand when we're talking about the sympathetic division. Sweating is a binary thing. It's like a light switch, it's either on or off, okay? So if you are sweating, right, your sympathetic division is active. If you're not sweating, your sympathetic division is not active. So when we're dealing with the sweat glands in our trunk, all right, Similar type of scenarios, all right? When the sympathetic division is active, you will start to sweat in those areas. Same thing with the erector pili muscles that are located throughout your skin, that smooth muscle that is anchored there at the, uh, the hair follicle, all right? The sympathetic division will stimulate that muscle to contract and that will elevate the hair follicle and the hair coming from the follicle. And then we saw in our last sympathetic uh, division pathways there, the adrenal medulla neurosecretory cells, how we only had that one, remember that preganglionic neuron that traveled out of the spinal cord directly to, all right, the medulla region of the adrenal gland, and it stimulates those neurosecretory cells. Same type of scenario with the light switch. They're either on or off. If they're on, they're pumping out the epinephrine and the norepinephrine into the blood. If they're off, they're not, make, they're not putting that stuff out. Which brings me into our first clinical view of this session, and that's Raynaud syndrome, okay? Raynaud syndrome is going to be when we see an exaggerated sympathetic response that occurs locally. Of course, we see it more often in women, and I see it quite often where um, some of my patients will come in, and more commonly women, and I only say that because in general, I just hear more cold complaints from women than I do from men, not saying one way or the other, maybe women are just more vocal about it. But um, when asked, I'll ask them certain things like, have you noticed any uh, discoloration in your fingers? Because in, in, in some of those patients, they'll say, I have rain outs, I have rain outs. You hear it all the time, oh, I have rain outs. And what they're referring to is what's called rain outs phenomena, which is similar to Raynaud's syndrome in the fact that we'll see constriction there of the smaller blood vessels in your fingers. And of course, that changes the color of the skin, right? In a lot of cases, when people say, I've got Raynaud's, and they're referring to Raynaud's phenomena, they won't really complain of pain. But when you have Raynaud's syndrome, okay, they'll see that change in the color of the skin, okay? And then, but they will say, it is painful. It is painful. Yes, commonly um, triggered by the cold, most often, but also we'll see it with emotional stress also. So that's the Raynaud syndrome. All right, so let's finish up here and talk about autonomic reflexes. So folks, this right here is a preview of what you're in store for for next semester. I find it fascinating, and I hope you will too, but I really want you to understand that if you get a good foundation now, you're going to be, I won't say breezing through Bio 211, but it'll be much easier on you, okay? It's not an easy class, but it doesn't have to be an impossible class because right here, right now, we can uh, learn a concept that will make it a little bit easier on us.
All right, so we're gonna talk about autonomic reflexes, also known as visceral reflexes. We learned about spinal reflexes back in chapter 14. All right, you step on a Lego, you pull your leg away, all right? Now we're gonna talk about the visceral reflexes that are generated through our autonomic nervous system here. Same type of scenario, we are going to be dealing with a reflex arc. So that means we need a stimulus and our reflex is going to be a pre-programmed response, which means it's gonna happen the same way every single time, as long as we have the proper stimulus. So we have the stimulus, then we have a receptor that is going to pick up that stimulus and then transmit the sensory inputs through our sensory neurons to our control center, which is the central nervous system. And that central nervous system is gonna process the information. And then it's going to determine what type of response that it is going to have depending on that uh, stimulus. So it will then send that output information, that motor command output through our motor neuron onto our effector. What are our effectors? It's the tail as old as time, folks. You know this by now. I hope and pray. Cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, or glands. So now we just have to apply those effectors to specific uh, systems in your body. And so we can do that. Let's start off here with the cardiovascular reflex, blood pressure. Okay, You're going to get into much more detail about this, but let's keep it real basic, real simple, real basic. All right. So you have these receptors and they're located throughout your blood vessels. In fact, near the carotid artery there, the common carotid artery, you have a region there, you have this structure called baroreceptors, right? And these baroreceptors, uh, they sense stretch within the blood vessel. So if your blood is pushing, excuse me, if your heart is pushing more blood out with each beat for whatever reason, these receptors located within the blood vessel walls are going to sense that increase in stretch in the blood vessels, okay? And that will then send signals up to your brainstem, specifically the medulla oblongata to the cardiac center. That is your integration or control center. So it's gonna process that information and say, okay, all right, I see that there's an increase in the stretch in the blood vessel walls, right? We need to decrease that because again, we want to keep you in homeostasis. We want to keep you in that normal range. Right? That's the function of our autonomic nervous system to always maintain homeostasis, right? And so the stretch might be too much. So we want to decrease the stretch. So the cardiac center then says, all right, I got to decrease the stretch. How am I going to do that? Simple. We are going to inhibit the sympathetic division where at the same time, we're going to activate the parasympathetic division, all right, in regards to, all right, what the heart is going to be doing. So we know, all right, that the parasympathetic is going to decrease our heart rate. The sympathetic division increases the heart rate. So we shut off the part that's going to increase the heart rate. So we shut that off, and now we stimulate the part that's going to decrease our heart rate, and that's what happens. We decrease the heart rate and decrease the amount of blood leaving the heart. Guess what? We now decrease blood pressure because we decreased the amount of stretch on our blood vessel walls. Booyah. Now, folks, it, it, there's a little bit more involved and you're going to learn all that. But if you understand this, I'm telling you, I am telling you, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. All right and Bio211, and you might even really enjoy learning this stuff. Let's continue on with some of the other autonomic reflexes, all right? I know you didn't think when you woke up this morning that I was going to tell you how your body makes you poop and pee, but guess what? That's where I'm going. So let's talk about the first one, the gastrointestinal reflex, which we call the defecation reflex. All right, let's set up the story. All right, so you've been eating food and food and food, and it's traveling through your digestive tract. 
right? It's made its way down to the distal portion of your digestive tract, specifically, all right, the rectum. Because the rectum's job is to store fecal matter, and that's what it does. So it starts to collect, the fecal matter starts to collect in your rectum. And the more that collects there, the more stretch on the walls of the rectum will occur. So the sensory neurons that reside in the walls of the rectum will, will monitor this. And so when the stretch increases, increases, it'll start to send information to your central nervous system. In this case, it doesn't go to the brain. It goes to the sacral portion, okay? The sacral portion of your spinal cord. It doesn't even have to go all the way up to the brain. So it goes to the sacral portion of your spinal cord. And that's, again, that's going to be our integration control center area. The spinal cord, all right, integrates the information, processes it, and then it decides on how it's going to respond. Well, we see that there's an increased stretch. We want to decrease that stretch. So the spinal cord sends signals out through the motor neurons to the smooth muscle in the walls of the rectum. And it causes those smooth muscles to contract in the walls of the rectum. All right, that's the first part, great. All right, but there's an opening somewhere for that fecal matter to leave. And so right now that opening is closed. We need to open that opening. All right, that's this structure here, the internal anal sphincter. The internal anal sphincter is closed. So, okay, those motor neurons are gonna cause the walls of the, of the rectum to contract. At the same time, it will relax the internal anal sphincter. And then you can defecate and get rid of that fecal matter. Now I'm not mentioning the external anal sphincter because guess what? The external anal sphincter is made up of skeletal muscle. Well, Dr. Kaz, skeletal muscle does not fall within any of the effectors of our autonomic nervous system. You are correct in thinking that you are. You're absolutely correct. That falls under the somatic nervous system. Well, guess what? You learn how to control the external anal sphincter when your parents, right, or whoever did the toilet training with you, right, they are teaching you how to control that. So there's a, another part, and again, you'll get into much more detail about this, but part of defecation is relaxing the external anal sphincter, okay, because there's been times when I'm sure you've had to go to the bathroom, but yet there's not a bathroom nearby. And so you were grateful that you would have been toilet trained, right? Not to lose control. Well, that's due to the external anal sphincter, but you can only hold it so long that you have to find a bathroom sometime, okay? So that's the other part that's um, not so much part of the autonomic reflexes, but I figured I'd just throw that out there. All right, the other reflex is the micturation reflex, all right, when you're going pee, same type of scenario. We have stretch receptors in the walls of the bladder. And as the bladder fills up, the stretch increases. So those nerve signals go again to the spinal cord. And it integrates, processes that information, and then decides, OK, um, we've got to get rid of this urine. So it sends motor command signals down to the smooth muscle that is found within the walls of the bladder. And it causes those muscles to contract squeezing the urine out, but, but again, we have to deal with some urinary sphincters. You have an internal urinary sphincter, okay, under autonomic control, so it'll cause those muscles to relax, and then you have an external, all right, urinary sphincter in which you learn how to control during that toilet training that I was mentioning before during the defecation reflex, okay. So we'll see all that. You'll get into much more detail about that uh, in bio uh, 211. So again, this is a great picture here, all right? So as the bladder fills up with water and it increases the amount of stretch here in the walls of the bladder, right? you'll get that sensory information traveling here to the sacral portion of your spinal cord, all right? It gets processed here. And then the motor neuron, all right, descends from the sacral spinal cord out to the effectors located in the walls here of the bladder and also 
here in the internal urethral sphincter, get that to relax. Down here, you can't see, well, it's not labeled, but this is called the levator ani. This is where the external anal sphincter, this is the muscle that you learn how to control during uh, toilet training. And so you have to get this muscle to relax and this muscle to relax, and then urine can then leave, all right, through the urethra out of the bladder. Then finally, our last clinical view of the night is what we call autonomic dysreflexia. And this is a, a scenario in which you see, all right, your blood pressure just rising through the roof. And because of that, we see the stimulation here of the sympathetic reflex. So when this occurs, we already talked about, all right, that vasomotor tone. All right, so what happens, all right, when we get the sympathetic reflex to occur, all right, it's going to cause significant all right, vasoconstriction throughout your entire, well, I shouldn't say your entire, but the majority of your cardiovascular system, the blood vessels there. And what happens is, now I don't want to go into too much detail, okay, but you'll learn um, that blood pressure can be calculated, BP is equal to what we call total peripheral resistance, all right, multiplied or times your heart rate. So those are the two things that affect your blood pressure, okay? Heart rate. So if you increase your heart rate, you're going to increase your blood pressure. If you increase what's called the total peripheral resistance, and that's basically, all right, how much of your arterial blood system is contracted. Okay, or vasoconstricted. So if we see that a majority of the arteries in your cardiovascular system have vasoconstricted, that's going to increase your total peripheral resistance. And because of that, we are going to see an increase in blood pressure. All right, so what we'll do is we'll see this all right, after a spinal cord injury. So after a spinal cord injury, that's always one of the concerns that we see is we'll see an hyperactivity of the autonomic nervous system, which can cause this sympathetic reflex. Or if we see an issue here, all right, of T6 vertebrae or above, if you take a blow, okay, to the base of your, uh, uh, well, I should say, the base of your neck between your shoulder blades, a little bit higher, we can see, all right, because of that injury there, all right, a strong stimulus can occur in which we can see, for example, an issue with bathroom habits, which is not anything that anyone wants to have. But what will happen is you'll see a strong sympathetic reflex with no opposition from the parasympathetic nervous system. So what did we just get done doing for the past five, 10 minutes? We talked about two reflexes that were based on the parasympathetic division, micturation, and, all right, defecation. So what we'll see is, all right, the sympathetic spinal reflex, you know, going out of control. So an increase in blood pressure, right? But now we've, if, for example, if you get a spinal cord injury at, in your neck, say you damage the spinal cord at C5, well, remember, the control center for micturation and for defecation is down in the sacral spinal cord. That's below. So we've essentially just said, to heck with you, parasympathetic division. The only thing that we can deal with now is the sympathetic spinal reflex. Well, guess what? You will see these patients with distended bladders or distended bowels because that whole autonomic reflex has been thrown out of whack. And so there can be some huge issues with that. All right, folks, that concludes, that was faster than I thought it was going to be, but that concludes um, the lecture for chapter 15.